In this video, we're going to begin looking at continuous charge distributions and the electric fields they create. We want to be able to study continuous macroscopic objects that are more useful to us, but we cannot simply look at each individual charged particle that's in that object. Instead, we will look at an object's charge density, which tells us how the charge is distributed throughout the object. Our first example will be a finite line of charge, and then we'll expand to an infinite line of charge. But first, let's look at charge density. For a line of charge, there will be a linear charge density, or charge per unit length, usually denoted with a Greek lambda. A surface, like a metal plate, would have a surface charge density, or charge per unit area. Often, surface densities are represented with a Greek sigma, but we will use an eta instead, since we will use sigma for conductivity a little later. Other three-dimensional objects might have volume charge densities, typically denoted with a rho. It's important to be comfortable with densities of all sorts because they are properties of entire objects. If we know the density, we can use calculus and integrate over the dimensions of the object to solve for what we're looking for. In this case, charge contributions to the electric field. If we know the charge density, instead of looking at each individual charge, the density will tell us how much charge is in a given length, for example. We can account for all of the charge by just knowing how long the object is. And similarly for areas and volumes. Densities connect quantities and coordinates. For cases where the density is uniform or constant, we can write charge as the linear charge density times a length, surface charge density times area, or volume charge density times volume. This assumes the charge density is uniform, but if not, we can just use a little calculus to integrate and find the total charge in some region of the object. If we have a rod or a line of charge with linear charge density lambda and length L, we can get the total charge by summing up each small charge delta Q along the rod. So we can say that in a small region, or length delta X, there is a small amount of charge delta Q. And adding these up gives all the charge. Since this is a macroscopic continuous object with many, many charges, rather than using a sum, we use an integral. Now we use the power of densities. Rather than adding up all of the charge, we can instead replace Q with the density times the length and essentially count for all of the charge by just integrating over the length of the rod. If the density is uniform or constant, the integral is even easier because it factors out. So let's look at our finite rod and find the electric field created by all of the charge some distance away. As always, we can choose our coordinate system in a convenient way, so we'll place the x-axis crossing the center of our vertical rod to create symmetry. Doing this means that for every charge above the x-axis, there is an equal charge below the x-axis, and their y components of the electric field will be in opposite directions, so they will cancel. The electric field will only have an x component, or be in a direction perpendicular to the line of charge. Since we'll be looking at very small charges and integrating, we can find the electric field using our expression for the electric field of a point charge, which is very small. We can write our 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught out front. Then we have the small amount of charge divided by the distance squared, which we'll write as r. Finally, the x component for the angle we've drawn is given by cosine because it is the adjacent side. Now we want to integrate over the length or coordinate of the object. So we'll replace dq with the charge density times the small length dy, which is along the y direction. We'll take lambda to be constant. So the density is just given by the total charge divided by the total distance, q over l. The distance r can be written in terms of x and y using our right triangle. And cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, or x over r. We can also substitute r from the step above. You can now see why all of these terms are behind the integral sign, because we're integrating over the length, or y, and all of these terms depend on y. Plugging this in, we get the following integral. The total charge and total length are constant, or stay the same, so they come out of the integral. We have x in the numerator from the cosine, and dy from substituting for dq. Then r squared and the r from our cosine gives us r cubed, or x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves power. This is either an integral you remember how to solve from calculus, or you can look it up in an integral table, which gives you the following, and then we evaluate at our limits. Our L from before cancels with the L from evaluating at our limits. Then we essentially have two copies of everything in brackets, because the two negative signs will become positive. 
and the minus L over 2 becomes positive when it is squared. These two copies give us a factor of 2 which cancels the 2 in our limits. This is our final equation for the electric field of a finite rod or line of charge. We've written it in terms of only the magnitude of the field because having a negatively charged rod gives the same answer just with a field pointing in the opposite direction. We can also look at the case where we look at the field far from the rod, or when R is much, much larger than L, the length of the rod. In this case, L over 2 is negligible, so we ignore it. The square root of R squared that gets left over just becomes R. This multiplies our other R, giving us R squared, and we see that if you go far enough away, or essentially zoom out, the field looks like a point charge having the same magnitude of charge as the rod. Now we can briefly look at an infinite line of charge. We have already solved for the field, so we don't need to integrate again. We're just changing the size of L. Specifically, we're taking the limit as L tends to infinity. As you may remember from calculus, you often need to rewrite your function before you can get a sensible answer for a limit. I'll show an extra step since this can be confusing. To do this, we're going to factor out L over 2 squared from the radical. To do this, I'll write L squared over 4, which is just distributing our exponent. Now we can ask, what would we need to multiply by in order to regain our original expression? L squared over 4 is the same as L over 2 all squared, so we just need to multiply by 1 to get this term. Then, to just get the R squared term, we need the L squared and 4 to cancel, so we multiply by the reciprocal. You can check to see that these are indeed equivalent. And now the square root of L squared over 4 just becomes L over 2. We're ready to take our limit, but first we can write Q over L as lambda, our linear charge density. Then, taking L to infinity, the second part of our radical gets really small and goes to 0, leaving the square root of 1. And 1 over 1 is just equal to 1. This leaves our equation for the electric field of an infinite line of charge. Again, this is a vector where the direction depends on the sign of the charge. So we'll write that and place the density in absolute value bars. Notice this has a different form than the electric field of a point charge. It only depends on r, not r squared. So, as you move away from the infinite line of charge, the drop-off in field strength is slower than that of a point charge. I'll write both results here as a summary. This is the first continuous charge distribution we'll look at. Other common charge distributions are a ring of charge, disk of charge, infinite plane of charge, and a sphere of charge, which we'll use new techniques to solve. So that's it for this video, and I'll see you in the next one.